I want to introduce the uh, members of the panel for this segment, and I'll start at the end there. Uh, to the extreme right is Attorney Lawrence Bose, who is the current president of the Houston Lawyers Association, one of the strong allies of Black United Front. To his left is Sister Ada Edwards, who is the founder and chair of the Ida Lee Delaney Byron Gillum Justice Committee. She'll be moving to this table a little later on to make a presentation about the Citizens Review Board. Uh, to her left is Mr. Keith Branch, who's one of the leaders of the National Association of Blacks in Criminal Justice. He's also an attorney. Uh, sitting next to him is uh, a pastor who takes after my own heart. That's Reverend Ernest Charles, the pastor of St. Savior Baptist Church. And uh, to my immediate right is Brother Charles X. White of Charity Productions, a longtime organizer as well as a member of the Nation of Islam. And at the request of um, Councilwoman Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, we wanted to add someone to our agenda who um, was not on it, who was a civilian employee of the Houston Police Department, uh, Mr. Bonds, and we wanted to offer him just a moment to just outline uh, some of the areas that of uh, concern that he have, has experienced uh, with the Houston Police Department. Then we'll move to the presentation from the, the, uh, the union organization, Mr. Bonds. Thank you. Uh, I want to make a slight correction there. I am a former employee of the Houston Police Department. I'm currently at the municipal courts. My name is Reginald Bonds, and I am uh, a five-year uh, city employee. Uh, I am a systems consultant. Uh, my responsibilities are for the microcomputer support at the municipal courts. Um, I have 18, 18 years in the business. Uh, back in 1980, uh, when the Houston Police Department took receipt of the current computer system that they used, the uh, vendor of that system was my employer. Uh, I basically came with the package to uh, help get the system up. Uh, at that time, I was an employee of the vendor. I later was hired as a city employee to help support that system. Uh, a few years later, I left to go into um, private industry and returned to the city of Houston at the municipal court. Uh, the, one of the, com I guess, complaints or concerns that I'd like to express was when I made an um, application to return to the department as a systems consultant and was denied that opportunity. And I, the person, uh, I guess, that's most responsible for having denied me that opportunity has left. I was hoping to get to speak while he was here. Uh, in July of 1990, the um, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives held their conference here, of which I am a member. And uh, during that time, I was told by the um, section supervisor over there who works for Mr. Bob Camp, who was the person I was speaking of, that they were going to create system consultants positions within the department and that um, I should probably apply. Upon um, inquiring into those positions, um, I was told that um, they really weren't interested in anyone who had spent the last five years supporting microcomputers. I asked the person, uh, Mrs. Zana Stefanek, who at that time was the bureau director over there, uh, if she had talked with any of her staff uh, regarding my interest in coming back. She was a little bit evasive in, in her response, but she finally came out and told me that I must be crazy if I think that she would hire me to take one of her current people's jobs. And, many, and the people that I'm speaking of are people who came to the department after I had been there and had been responsible for training them. Knowing that I was qualified for employment in that division, when the posting was actually issued back in August of 1990, I responded. The posting closed after six days. This was a posting that was open citywide. In September of 1990, I contacted the Police Department Personnel Division regarding the status of that posting. I was told that they had only had, uh, at maximum, four people who were interested in the position and that my application was not one of them. After I complained, I was later given an interview October 10th uh, with Mr. Bob Camp. And my initial contact with Mr. Camp and the police department was uh, when I came to the department as an analyst for the vendor. The first microcomputer that was ever purchased by the city of Houston, I requisitioned and took receipt of that unit. Um, 
Mr. Kemp, when he gave me my interview, did not feel comfortable in interviewing me alone. He did interview me with another man, Mr. Coy Baskins, and their focus in the interview was not on the job, but why I wanted to come back to the computer services department. Um, in talking with them, it was apparent that Mr. Kemp and Mr. Baskins were very uncomfortable with the fact that I had applied for the position. I think that they had written the posting for someone who was already on staff. Uh, neither could be specific about the exact duties that this person was going to perform, although they were spelled out in the posting. And previous conversations that I had had with them implied that they needed someone for microcomputer support. I thanked them for the opportunity for the interview and, and left. I did not hear any more about this interview until November 8th of 1990. Uh, when talking with Mr. Kemp regarding that, I telephoned the uh, police department personnel section to ask about the status of my application. She stated that I was not selected and that um, she really didn't have anything to do with the selection, that the division actually does the hiring. Okay. Later that same morning, I did speak with Mr. Kemp again, and he told me that uh, he was really concerned about my wanting to come back to the department. Uh, he, f he had found out that I had been promoted to the position that they were offering from, si from a senior program analyst to a systems consultant, which was a position that they were offering. And they said, well, if you've already been promoted to the position, why do you want to come over here? Well, the system at the police department, as it currently is, there is uh, evidence of the programming that I had done for the city some 10, 11 years ago. And, you know, if I could not be a contribution to that group, then why are the things that I develop over many years still remaining on the system? Um, after talking with Mr. Camp again, I reminded him that uh, the person that I was told who had been selected for the position had bragged to a couple other people that she had gotten the position and that she really wasn't qualified, but she'd do the best that she could do. I telephoned Mr. Camp again, and he informed me that he, was, uh, he had not made a decision Although I had received a call from a lieutenant in personnel who told me that, um, you know, you didn't get the job, and if there's a fight, you will lose. And I told this lieutenant, and his name was Goralski, that since you believe that I will lose the fight, it's your guarantee that there will be a fight. And since that time, I have pursued some avenues of complaint with the people involved in that. And uh, I really don't have a lot of time allotted to me, uh, but this thing did go on for quite a while. And to date, um, the lady who supposedly got the job is working in that job. What the police department did, because I did a um, complaint to the EEOC commission, the police department um, canceled the posting that I had applied for, thereby they didn't have to fill it with uh, my application, and they later promoted the lady to the position. And that's one of the complaints that I do have um, regarding them. There are a few others. But this is one that I did want to bring up. Thank you very much. We want to ask now that um, the representatives of the African American and Hispanic police organizations now come forward. And we'd like to ask also to join them. Uh, who stopped? Yeah. May Walker, who's president of the Afro American Police Officers League. Sergeant Cedric Knight, Officer Reginald Gillum, and Officer Justo Garcia of the Organization of Spanish-Speaking Officers now would make their presentations. <coughs> Mr. Gillum. Good evening. I am May Walker, and I'm president of the Afro-American Police Officers League, and I'm going to, going to read from a, a statement that I've made so we can be real brief, and I'll give you a little bit of background about myself also. I am, um, I'm originally from Louisiana, but I've been in Houston most of my life. I'm a graduate of Cashman Gardens High School, a graduate of Texas Southern University in business administration, and a master's from the University of Houston in business education, and presently I'm working on a doctorate of jurisprudence. And uh, I've been president of the Afro-American Police Officers League for the last two years, 
and prior to coming to the police department, I was instructor in Houston Independent School District. We wanted to give you a little bit of information and a little bit of documentation what we have gathered from uh, the officers at the police department, and we want to make sure that you understand that the officers that you've heard here testifying is just a small fraction of the officers that have problems at the police department. And th this year has not been the tilt of complaining about discrimination at the police department. We've been complaining since 1975. We've been uh, pleading for someone to come to our assistance. We've filed discrimination lawsuits. We've done all kinds of things. In one span of that department, we can say that all the problems were not solved, but we did have a listening ear. And of course, that was under Chief Brown's administration. And we were, we did have the ability to sit down and talk about problems. All of them were not solved. Discrimination persisted in the police department. The Afro-American Police Department was founded on the premises of educating, recruiting, and retaining black officers at the Houston Police Department. Our goals and objectives of our organization is to bridge the gap between the community and the police department. We address the needs of the community and uh, serve as a referral for the community's needs. Another objective is to motivate and encourage youth in our community to pursue a career in law enforcement, specifically the police department. This year, and, and the 90s, APOL experienced a tremendous amount of dissent among the minority officers, and specifically black officers at HPD. They have been, they have alleg allegations of blatant discrimination, harsh punishment, retaliation, and job assignments. We have gathered numerous situations and evidence of substantiating allegations which some have uh, been presented to you today, and the others will be presented to Chief Watson on a later date. We're gonna share with you our position on three items here uh, that affect minorities seriously in the Houston Police Department. And I'm going to give you a little bit about a survey that we did of the black officers in the police department. We got Officer Sergeant Knight is going to talk about the rule of three. And uh, Officer Gilliam is going to talk about the master patrol. The AAPOL pres uh, submitted a, presented a survey to all black officers. Our members we have presently at, the H at HPD we have 595 officers. We presented this survey to all the officers, ones that are members of the organization and one that are non-members of the organization. We're just gonna share with you a few of the things that they said and most of the things were unanimous on the part of most of these officers that turned in the survey. 70% of these uh, officers were male officers, 30% were females that filled out this survey, 60% was between the ages of 31 and 40, and 50% of them were na native Houstonians and the others were people from out of state. 95% had higher education, some associate degrees and uh, uh, other degrees and higher. 50% um, of them had been with HPD between uh, six and 10 years. The others were either less or more. 80% uh, were assigned to field operations, specifically patrol officers. 80% had never been promoted in the Houston Police Department. 95% felt that there was no equal opportunity at, at, at HPD. 40% had been victims of retaliation. 98% felt that, that, um, that there's discrimination at HPD and they were victims of discrimination. 95% were punished Harsh, more harshly and feel the grievance procedure does not work. And 85% of them feel that there is no sensitivity for minorities at HPD. From the outcry of, of, of the concerns of these black officers at the, at the police department, AAPOL uh, pre presented these problems and um, obtained some solutions from those officers that complained. And uh, one point that we wanted to make sure that came out, we acknowledged the, the, the appointment of the task force and we, we, we uh, appreciate it, but we feel that is not gonna deal with the problem that the officers have and that's discrimination. As you can tell from the, the, uh, the few officers that participated this morning, that they were very upset and we feel that it's, it's gonna be a serious situation at HPD and they're just a few of those officers that have came forward. As all the other officers have told you, the other officers are afraid to come up here and sit behind this desk and tell you about what's happening to them because it is 
has been a long term of retaliation at HPD, and I would assure you it's going to continue next week when we go back to work. Um, uh, we are going to present, after I get through, I want to give you a few of the solutions that we arrived at uh, from the officers that had been a part of uh, all these uh, discriminatory procedures at HPD. And uh, we're going give to you, give you, share some of the solutions that we've come up with in reference to racial slurs, harassment, sexual biases, and abuse, and racial motivated material. We, the solutions that our organization came up from the, the officers that have been involved is make supervisors more accountable if they um, perform, if they, if they uh, implicate you in something and it's, it's found not true, we hope something can be done about them implement a check and balance situation. We feel that when you have, uh, you have some kind of uh, concern that your supervisor is not adequate enough to be the one to determine whether you're wrong. And we're saying one major thing that most officers said that there should be a uh, human relation uh, section formulated HPD to deal with some of the problems that we have. In reference to harsh punishment, some of the so solutions that were brought forth was provide standard, standardized policies, place minorities in key positions uh, that, administer, that administer disciplinary action, and also place minority in division, the divisional level of, of disciplinary actions, because we now have no minorities that are part of implementing the disciplinary actions. And formulate a new power structure, uh, fair representation of minorities in disciplinary process, and the disciplinary committees. Uh, disciplinary committees should consist of officers and supervisors and not just people from top management. We want to provide a plan to solicit unbiased person for the disciplinary committee and IAD, et cetera, by circulars. Uh, impartial investigation in IAD, check, we, we are asking that it be a check and balance system. When, we, when someone alleged that something was not right, it should be somebody independent to check and make sure. Uh, in reference to retaliation, no retaliation when grievance are, fi are filed. We have not figured out how you can do that at this time. Full investigation, uh, if, if there's any sign of retaliation uh, on a person. We want to have a full investigation of that and develop uh, the sec under retaliation. Everybody is saying there needs to be a human relations committee with all rank, uh, ranks of um, uh, officers and supervisors. And as far as assignments, we are asking that there be a unified mean of assignments over the entire police department and not be um, each substation decide um, how, you, how their assignments are assessed and require each substation to post availability of assignments. We are asking that uh, positions be determined by seniority at substations and division and on a rotating basis with uh, top seniority first, middle seniority, and then uh, um, last seniority, giving everybody the fair opportunity of, of, of being able to get different assignments posting for available assignments for 60 days before the selections. We, w we want to see the captains removed so you can't use the good old boy system because we're finding that all the assignments are normally going to, to the captains or the lieutenants, their friends, and not equally distributed to all the officers. We're saying supervisors who violate the policy has to justify it in writing to the chief. And in... Uh, in, in the major commands and div divisions have a fair amount of minorities. These are some of the solutions that we've come up in reference to uh, those four areas um, that we, we've given you. And now we'll let... Um, May I want to make a comment before you move to uh, Officer Gillum that I think illustrates this point that you just mentioned about uh, in major commands and divisions have a fair amount of minorities. Uh, in investigating what's happening in the SWAT team, I think there are one or two members of SWAT team that are black. And I think in 17 years, SWAT has only had five black officers ever to serve in that division. And it's critically important to us in the community that in the specialized divisions that there be significant minority representation. Now, as I was reviewing this recently, 
there are two methods that I understand. I'm sure members of the command staff will correct me if my information is wrong. Two methods by which officers are uh, assigned to SWAT. One is method A, one is method B. And as I understand method, method B is the best man wins, the best person who, who scores the highest on the various tests and so forth is put in. Method A uh, involves seniority. So seniority begins to interact more than just who scores highest on the various tests. Now this, and each, each way it seems like on the surface is fair. But in reality, since most of the officers who would go into SWAT who are black are young, they clearly have less seniority and are clearly at a disadvantage in being selected to SWAT, although athletically and ability otherwise, they might actually score highest on the test. And so there's been a, just a new change in which they've changed it from the method in which the best person wins and changed it to seniority. And already we see the impact on the potential and likelihood of minorities, uh, in fact, being chosen for SWAT. And this is why we're saying to the public and elected officials and the command staff that when we look at a policy that on the surface may seem fair, there must be a much more objective investigation of those policies, see of the impact of that decision and how it's going to impact minorities. And on these next two issues that your organization is going to speak to, the mass patrolman issue and the rule of three, this becomes even more apparent. What appears to be very fair on the surface has very dynamic impacts then on the opportunities that minorities have to advance. My name is Reginald Gillum. I'm a Houston police officer. I'm, assi I'm assigned to the uh, Central Patrol Division. What I have before me, I have a prepared uh, uh, speech, and more or less I'm going to sort of read this because uh, I'm going to cover some issues that I'm going to have to just sort of go through them. Is this a little, is that better? Great, okay. Prior to, prior to 1982, the Houston Police Department experienced notable problems retaining seasoned police officers in our city. Unfortunately, this problem seems to persist. From a high of 4,506 police officers in 1986, we have dropped to approximately 3,900 officers nearing the, near the beginning of this year. On February the 24th, 1982, Houston City Councilman John Goodner wrote to Mayor Kathy Widmire advising that the mayor, city council members, and police officials must address the issue of retention of experienced police officers. Councilman Goodner emphasized in this correspondence that in his estimation, the Houston Police Department must find newer and more productive methods of motivating HPD officers who have trained on the force to remain on the department until retirement minimums that is, at least 20 years. Also, encouraging officers to serve beyond 20 years of service, and finally, convincing officers to serve their entire careers at HPD when possible. Of paramount importance, Councilman Goodner pointing out, pointed out that the department was losing too many experienced and model police officers to other working environments, namely other law enforcement agencies, and that HPD's point of point of maximum loss for separating officers was the eight-year level and beyond. Hence he asserted, Mayor Whitmire, I am more convinced than ever that the creation of the, prof that, that the, creation of the professional patrolman's rank is the only program that actually offers a solution to our present and future problems of the retention of our seasoned officers in the Houston Police Department. From this source of origin, and perhaps others, the idea, or rather, the, the process of formulating, developing, and implementing a master police officer concept via an interdepartmental committee within the Houston Police Department was born. Nearly a decade later, the Afro-American Police Officers League was invited to participate via an organizational representative in this process during November 1990. And from that earliest invitation, APOL, under the leadership of our President May Walker and Board of Directors, has clearly articulated that our organization overwhelmingly and unequivocally supports, this, supports the concept 
of a master police officer program. Today, we have a framework of an innovative, healthy, and most admirable MPO program proposal available to us. This is a proposal we have to develop. We are proud of it, and we have not flip-flopped or changed our position regarding this issue. However, deliberate, ruthless lies and offensively malicious misinformation seemingly circulating only within the department attempt to persuade others that our president and board of directors do not support the MPO program and are thus engineering some sort of destructive campaign against the MPO concept and program. This is not true. In fact, APOL supports the MPO concept for the most sensitive and most humane of reasons, namely police officers' accountability to the citizens and neighborhoods can be improved, police officers' accountability inside the department can be improved, police officers' responsiveness to the citizens and the community can be improved, police performance can be improved, officers' morale can be improved, officers' job satisfaction and job fulfillment can, can be up, improved upon, officers' job enrichment will be enhanced, and, and more fitting upward mobilities for officers can be achieved under this program. We believe the integrity of the MPO concept is based on the police's goodwill to improve police performance, public safety, and the quality of neighborhood life. Additionally, we believe that the integrity of the program rests on its key values outlined in the, in the department's plan of action. And I'll just sort of go through uh, these values right quick for uh, you. Officer Gillen, let me ask, if this is your, your presentation, are you basically saying that, if I understand you correctly, that you support the Mass Police Officer Program? Is there anything that needs to be adjusted in the way it's been proposed? Yes, and, and I have that in Can too. Can you go to that? Because I, sure. I, I, I okay. think that's where the primary thrust is. Okay. It is not enough to say we care for our own and that we know how best to satisfy and operate. We must show it. In Houston, for example, police officers achieve upward mobility by successfully testing for promotions, being selected, and accepting their promotions to the progressive ranks of sergeant, lieutenant, captain, etc. Now, acceptance of promotion within these ranks by the individuals assert that the persons are inherently department supervisors as well as, in some instances, specialists or, or authorities in their realm of responsibilities. Many supervisors admit that they only pursue the traditional supervisory career track or administrative track simply because of the money involved and that if they would have been offered equal or similar choices for upward mobility, which were non-supervisory in nature, then they would have chosen the non-supervisory route. Consequently, many police employees are holding supervisory assignments which they either loathe or simply have no interest in. It follows then that the prudent, it follows then that the prudent becomes what level our quality of supervisory service is this disenchanted employee providing. The master police officer program concept corrects this unfortunate dilemma by fostering exceptional, exceptional non-supervisory job status, higher technical job skill levels, credible pay increases and salaries, and model police responsibilities to the career aspirants. Once the program is implemented, exceptional officers who aspire up with mobility in a non-supervisory capacity should be able to achieve their job aspiration consistent with their ambitions. And in this vein, police officers who truly aspire being polu police supervisors will find appropriate opportunities available to them. If designed correctly, our citizens, our citizens' daily exposure to these ever-growing benefits derived up under NOP will become commonplace and a most deserving expectancy at the neighborhood level. Moreover, enthusiasm, both inside and outside of the department for NOP, will be abundant. We must sometimes remind ourselves that where there is an open mind, there will always be a frontier. The MPO program is a means to facilitate NOP. It is not a means to give officers a pay raise for doing the same thing. The purpose of NOP is 
is to allow the police to be more responsive to the community. For example, the master police officer who engages in NOP will be doing more complex problem solving during his or her shift of duty. They will be directly responsible for the citizens in their beat. They will be held accountable for identifying and resolving crimes in their beat. They will be judged on the, on the effectiveness with which they manage certain police problems and calls for service in their beat. And in this sense, the beat officer is the chief of his or her neighborhood, totally responsible to the citizens who make up the neighborhood. Therefore, why not give them the same accountability as the chief? It is not enough for us to have good minds. The main thing is us, for us to use it well. We must allow community input directly into the selection process of the master police officers at the beat officers level. Now, we had a meeting out at the, uh, at the academy several weeks ago, and uh, one of the things that I tried to bring up during these meetings was that we need an assessment panel. Officers who, uh, who, who, who were uh, candidates for the MPO position in, 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 in APO's estimation, they, they should be, in addition to other things, judged by an assessment panel, and that panel can be made up of uh, uh, police uh, uh, supervisors within the department, as well as uh, uh, people, respectable people from the community. However, that, that really didn't go over very well, and, and we had a various uh, amount of responses. But in any regards, uh, the question becomes, why can't the community have input into the decision-making process regarding who becomes a master police officer in, in their neighborhoods at levels one, two, three, and four? Would that be inconsistent with the values outlined in our plan of action? Would we be engaging in some sort of public sin? APO believes that we need to become more responsive to our neighborhoods. But the attitude of some officers is they do not want to be accountable to the public. For example, during several committee meetings, I often brought up the idea of including citizens on the Master Police Officers Assessment Board panel. Some officers stated, and quote, I don't want no citizens telling me whether I can get a pay raise or not, end of quote. Another officer stated, we don't want no civilians down here meddling into our business. And, a, and another officer stated, I don't want no Judon Boney down here sitting on a committee judging me. Now these types of attitudes are wrong. They are extremely offensive. They're demeaning and certainly seem inconsistent with the values outlined in the plan of action. Moreover, they are not in harmony with NOP. To the contrary, APO believes that we need citizen input. We need as much as we can get. Valuable tools for assessing potential MPO candidates include an officer's disciplinary files, complaints by citizens, and work or attendance files. These types of tools can help provide assessment panel members with credible information for gauging the officer's community suitability for paid tenure and longevity in the neighborhoods. Additionally, these tools would strengthen the integrity of the proposal, which seemingly rewards only time, education, and type of assignment held as con controlling criteria. If police officials oppose the use of this type of information based on the notion that the information stress stresses negative factors, then I submit to them that they are partially correct. Even, but even if the information does flirt with negative factors, nevertheless, the information is extremely important and its value outweighs the negative insignificance. For instance, setting up an institution and using these types of criteria would send a clear message to people attracted to policing for the wrong reasons that this is not the job for them. More specifically, some police applicants and even some experienced police employees have a t TV image of the duties and roles of a police officer. They sincerely be <clears throat> believe that in order to function properly, you must enjoy beating up, beating up people and controlling blacks like Buona of the Jungle. They often visualize the quest for authority, power, action, excitement, 
and other Hollywood idolizations. Officers who have these perceptions tend to be the ones who hurt themselves and others needlessly. These types of persons can be identified and prevented from becoming master police officers if the assessment board is granted access to the candid candidate's disciplinary and attendance files. The department, however, is making enormous progress under NOP. Once the MPO program is implemented, the department-wide utilization and coordination of this of its patrol management plans that they use at Westside, the PIP programs, and a host of other neighborhood-based programs and its crime prevention e uh, efforts such as the Lower West Timer and the Link Valley or Death Valley initiatives and a host of other strategies will all come together and bring to fruition a peaceful and much safer city. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergeant Knight, speaking on the rule of three. My name is Cedric Knight. I'm a sergeant in Houston Police Department. Have, uh, joined the department in 1972 and have uh, almost 19 years on academy time as of uh, next month. Uh, first of all, before I begin, and I'll be very brief, I can see the heavy eye, eyelid, so I won't hold you too long. I'd like to commend those officers who were brazen enough and courageous enough to come forth and uh, give their testimony as uh, to the problems and the concerns that they've been facing on the job. I can relate to that as having uh, been around long enough to, uh, to be able to share those concerns. I think out of all the uh, concerns that were expressed, and I can, uh, I, can, I can say this boldly because a lot of the folk on command staff, I, 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 I've known them since before, they were uh, upper management that uh, I can share some of those same experiences, probably all except for the fact of the sexual harassment. Uh, I, I, I can say that emphatically so and look anyone in the eye and say that the department definitely does have a problem, but I think this is a first step, and I hope that it's a lasting step in trying to rectify some of those problems. Uh, so much for that. My task is, uh, is not to belabor past history, but rather to uh, talk to you concerning the rule of three and how it affects blacks and Hispanics on the uh, police department. Uh, just to give you some uh, historical perspective of what I'm talking about so you won't be at a loss, those of you who are not uh, members of the police department, uh, we're governed by the, uh, the civil service code or the civil service statutes. And in that statute, it stipulates to its members how we are to conduct in-house business, being hiring, if it's hiring, firings, promotions, uh, transfers, so on and so forth. Uh, under sections 143.026, 143.036, and 08, it lists, it, 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 it stipulates uh, the method of, uh, of uh, examinations at the beginning uh, level positions. And in that, just to paraphrase and make it in, in short, testing uh, has to be done through an examination. And after which, the top three people who score on a given test are promoted in that sequential order, the, the, the top three highest grades. Now, at the latter part of this past year, within, within a department in-house, we had a legislative package that was put together by, the, uh, by City Hall and the uh, Chief's Office, and in that package, it, it, it stipulated some proposals, and in those in that package included proposals that the uh, chief uh, brought forth to the organizational heads, being uh, APOL, the union, HBOA, also, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, within that package, it contained the rule of three or the proposed changes within the rule of three, which would give the chief the latitude to be able to bypass a promotional candidate on that one, two, and three uh, uh, scoring order. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that in this proposal that was given to us, that was provided by the chief, by City Hall, was that the reasons why the change was needed was that under the current system of written examinations, it was felt that rank uh, candidates for hiring or promotion does not, does not allow uh, consideration for affirmative action plans. 
and generally has had an adverse effect on minorities. And with that in mind, uh, changes in Section 143 was sought so that the chief would have uh, the latitude of skipping or bypassing, as is stipulated, a, a candidate. Well, the Afro-American uh, Police Officers League and after conferring with OSO, we felt that this particular policy would 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 be detrimental to uh, to minorities. To, to cut it short, and I go into a lot of the history, but essentially, what it would do if the chief had the power under the rule of three to be able to bypass a promotional candidate was that she wouldn't have to give cause. Now at one time this was called the unrestricted use of the rule of three, but all of us will confer at the table here that it's, it's, it's changed so many times in what we're trying to do. But as of a circular that was passed in a department dated uh, April 17, 1991, uh, use of the rule of three in consideration for, for our future promotions, the chief stipulated in that circular that she would use uh, di past disciplinary history as a tool in deciding uh, if a person would be uh, promoted of those three candidates. Now, it is the belief and the consensus of this organization that such a tool to be used would adversely impact minorities simply because of the fact if you listen to the testimonies of folks who spoke today, blacks are disproportionately uh, disciplined in the system anyway. So if we're going to use a system for promotions that's going to take discipline in account, it's certainly going to adversely affect blacks. Uh, having been promoted, having been disciplined adversely, if I were one of the three candidates, well, I could certainly see that as a strikeout for myself if this was a criteria used. In addition uh, to that, if you just look at the sheer numbers of the amount of uh, blacks versus uh, whites who take the test, or minorities who take the test versus whites, it's such a disproportionate gap within the numbers, blacks don't even rank, I think only on two occasions historically, that we have, we came in the top three in the promotional list anyway. So if you have, say, on a sergeant's examination, you have 500 people taking the test and of which 100 are, are black, the numbers, in, in the numbers themselves show that there's going to be a smaller percentage of minorities who will score high on that test. And the rule of three does no justice to us because the percentages work against us. It, it, has, it, it has been very seldom that we have come in the top three position. So by having the latitude to be able to use the, the rule of three does us no good at all. And personally, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a weak attempt on the part of the chief and the administration to uh, satisfy uh, blacks and the powers that be by saying that we can use the uh, rule of three and discipline as an exclusionary factor to uh, promote one candidate over another. I, I think if the, if, the, if the chief has the community's interest at heart, just like she stipulated in this circular dated uh, uh, April 17th, she, she listed four, uh, four, four values, values, and I'll just read those values. Uh, one was to preserve and advance democratic values, improve the quality of life, improve, quali uh, improve quality of life, and demonstrate professionalism. Uh, I think if we took an honest approach by trying to solve the problem or bridge the, the gap that exists in uh, upper management in the police department, certainly we espouse the idea that if the city took an aggressive approach uh, toward passing an affirmative action package or, an affir or affirmative action legislation through Austin tied into section 143 that would mandate uh, a portion of those who took the test and passed that you would have to promote a number of minorities that would be representative of the uh, demographic makeup of uh, the city of Houston. Now that to me would be a more honest approach in trying to solve the disparity between uh, the ranks of m minorities and, uh, and whites rather than trying to use a, a stopgap approach of saying that we're going to use uh, discipline as a, as a criteria, because obviously blacks, minorities, browns, 
we suffer the, the greater burden of uh, the disciplinary system. Thank you. Be before we take any uh, questions from the panelists, we want to hear from the other organizational representative again. Uh, we want to give HPD some time to respond to some of this. And we the, pres the, the president, I would like to also, I guess, introduce to you those members of the chief's command staff and those members that were invited that are of Hispanic heritage. Would you please stand, please? <laughs> 